but they still, I mean, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, we have some English teachers in the building who are trying out this instructional technique called thinking hats, where kids wear different colored hats, and those hats correspond to different perspectives or point of view. So if you're having a conversation within an English mm -hmm. class, the idea is if you're wearing the orange hat, you're supposed to be taking a specific perspective, and then the kids change hats throughout the class. And one of my assistant principals, Tracy Kahlo, has been the one who's been kind of leading this. So the English as department as a department are going into each other's classrooms, observing each other trying out this teaching technique, then going back, trying it you know, themselves, having other people come in and observe them, and then I've been privy to some of the kind of emails back and forth where they're having these really in-depth conversations around what they're doing in their classrooms, critiquing themselves, giving each other positive mm -hmm. feedback, and just the extent to which they are kind of dedicated to reflecting on the craft of teaching and in um, working as professionals and collaborators to improve is something that um, is actually un and unfortunately not that common in a lot of schools and so that's been very impressive to me also. So you're saying there's a lot of teamwork between teachers instead of a bunch of rugged individualists doing their own thing. Yeah I mean I, I would say that I, I think that high school teachers are individualists to a certain extent. I think it to a certain extent kind of attracts that mindset. I mean that's I'm kind of an individualist myself and so you find at a fair number of high schools also kind of that things become very departmentalized and it's about our department and protecting our department, you know, whether it's budgets or rules or whatever. Within departments I see, you know, this was within the English department that there's this kind of sense of collegiality and sense of continuous improvement. But I also see it across departments too and I've, I've really seen that a lot um, in particular with my department heads. I meet with the department heads once a month and that's what I call my leadership council and working with them to try to solve school-wide decisions and I've been very impressed with the extent to which they work with each other, the extent to which they are able to represent the departments while also representing the school at the same time okay. and work with each other in honest ways but also in very constructive ways. So yeah, there is. I'm someone who believes very strongly in the idea of collaboration, so I'm someone who's always going to try to find more and more opportunities for people to collaborate with one another. But I've been very impressed with the, um, the extent to which people kind of already have that built in. Okay. How would, you ex how would you describe your approach to being a principal, and how does it differ from other people? I don't know how I would say I differ from other people. Um, my approach to being a principal, um, well, I'll share with you um, kind of what I shared, and I probably put this on my um, on the website at some point. But one of the things that I said to the staff throughout the interview process is, and this is something that also was true for me in my own school, is that I try not to be a micromanager. I very much believe in the idea that as a principal, you or a leader in any organization, you, you want to attract the best possible talent, and then you want to let them be really good. You don't want to get in their way. You don't want to muck things up too much. And so I try to respect the um, professionalism of the staff here and not, not get in their way. But at the same time, there are some core values that I believe in that I'm not really willing to negotiate on. Um, and so I shared this with them, and this is something that I, that I shared when I first started at the previous school also, but I kind of you know, created a little catchphrase, never give up, work together, and get better each day. And by never give up, I mean that we cannot give up on kids. One of the things, I, I think anyone can get up and disseminate information to teenagers. I think what, what makes someone a teacher, what makes someone a professional and not an amateur is that we figure out when things are difficult or challenging, or a kid is facing challenges, or a family is facing challenges, we figure out how to help that kid be successful. And so we don't give up on kids. And that doesn't just mean that I say to teachers, oh, you know, you need to figure out how to help this kid get a good grade. Or you, it's not on them. It's ultimately it's on me. You know, at the end of the day, when a kid in this building fails, that's my failure first and foremost because I'm responsible for everybody in the building. So I believe we don't give up on kids. Um, work together. I believe that and you probably heard me say this before, that I, I truly believe that a team can be smartest than the smartest individual in that team. I also believe that a team can be dumber than the dumbest individual in that team. I think a lot of it comes down to the um, different structures, processes, expectations that you have in the way in which you support teams. But I truly believe that team-based decision-making is, um, is more effective for kids than individual decision-making. And that's also true for me. When I have made bad decisions, and I've made plenty of bad decisions, they have pretty consistently been situations where I acted with incomplete information unilaterally and didn't fully understand a situation and hadn't gotten good impact. 
and usually as a principal, you make decisions that other people then implement. And so I made decision, and you know, other people then said, well, this doesn't make any sense. And the more I learned about it, I said, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And that's taught me over time that I need to also be gathering good information from people and collaborating with people in the decisions that I make because ultimately we get to better decisions. Um, and then get better each day is, I mean, I kind of referred to that, seeing that in the staff already, the idea that when we get better, kids and families are the beneficiaries of that improvement. So I think we have a moral and a professional responsibility to constantly be figuring out how to get better. So, you know, what kind of principal am I? Um, I don't know. Ask other people that question because, I, you know, one of the things I think you learn about being a principal or being a leader in an organization is that um, you have a sense of yourself and who you are as a leader, but that doesn't always jive with how other people perceive you. Um, you know, I mean, when I make decisions, they always make perfect sense to me, but then a lot of people say, well, you know, why did you make that decision? Um, and so I think because as a, as a principal, you are removed from a lot of, you know, I'm not in the classrooms, all the classrooms all day. I try to get into many, as many classrooms as I can, but you only see small snippets of what, what is happening in an organization. And so it's hard to understand sometimes kind of how you are perceived. I mean, I perceive myself as someone who cares a lot about kids, who cares a lot about people. Um, I kind of, I, I try to pride myself on being a kind, compassionate person because I think that's an incredibly important quality in, mm -hmm. um, in education. That doesn't mean that I don't have to make very difficult decisions that have negative ramifications for people at times, but um, I think it's important to bring kindness and compassion to the work that we do because it's a human endeavor. You know, I perceive myself as being someone who, I try to be a very cautious decision maker, but at the same time, be a decision maker you know, one of the responsibilities of a leader, I think, is that you have to be willing at times to put a stake in the ground whether people are going to agree or disagree with that stake. But I try to make sure that I'm making those decisions with as much information as I can possibly get and that I'm considering the ramifications of decisions. Um, I try to be someone who communicates a lot. I'm a big believer in um, as much transparency as possible and as much communication as possible. One of the things that I've started doing, I did it at my previous school and I, and I continued it here, is um, every week I do a phone call to parents, to all the parents, and then I also take that same text and do it as an email. I try to keep it short, no more than like 60 to 90 seconds, and it's just about upcoming, you know, like the one I'm doing this week will be about the chorus concert we have on Thursday. We have a comedy night tomorrow night. So trying to get people a heads up about things and communicate information, but it's also an opportunity for people to hear my voice uh, and just people to feel like they're in the loop on what's going on in the school. Um, also, communication through things like tomorrow morning I've got a student advisory council meeting. I meet with a group of interested students, and any, any student who wants to can show up um, the first Wednesday of every month, although this week we pushed it back to second Wednesday. And it's an opportunity for kids to ask me questions about what's happening in the school, voice their opinions, their feedback. We have a school council, which is composed of um, teachers, parents, and students and community members. That meets once a month, and I take their input very seriously. We're in the process of creating a school improvement plan based on that. I've had the opportunity to attend a number of school committee meetings, you know, I've really tried to listen to their input. Um, so I don't know, that's not a very succinct answer to your question. But. Oh, no, no, that's good stuff. Um, 